All right, today we're in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Before we get into that passage, I want to take a minute to just uh, take a look back through um, the creation of humanity, the fall of humanity, and also God's redemption of the human race. And so we want to start back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where the Bible says, So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And the Bible says that God told uh, the man and the woman to uh, be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. And so what we get as we look at this passage in Genesis is a picture of God's original intention and design for humanity on the earth. He created humans, uh, men and women, in his image. And it doesn't say this of anything else in God's creation. It doesn't say it of any of the animals, of the birds, of the fish. It doesn't say it of the rocks or the earth or the water. It doesn't say it of the plants, the animals, the trees, um, of the sun, the moon, the stars, any other thing. Only of men and women does it say that they were created in the image of God. And so we can see from this that God's intention for humankind was that we would, in some limited sense, um, reflect our creator. Okay, so if someone from another planet, some other race came to our planet and they saw um, human beings, that as they looked at human beings, they would see the creator in them. They could look at the, the design and they could see in the creature the, the, the evidence of the designer. Say, wow, some awesome creator must have made these creatures. Okay, and so uh, in that also is that the, the, the initial commission to the man and the woman was to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. And so God's initial plan design for humanity was that Adam and Eve would have children, their children would have children, and that would go on, and they would eventually fill the earth with image bearers, okay? And so the earth would be filled with the image of God, with the glory of God, and that all the creation would worship its creator. We know from Genesis 3 that the ser serpent um, confronted Adam and Eve in the garden, that the, the um, serpent deceived Eve, that Adam stood by passively right there watching the serpent deceive his wife, did nothing about it, that both of them ended up eating of the fruit. It says that the eyes of both of them were opened and that they knew that they were naked. In that moment, what happened was Adam and Eve chose to rebel against the authority, the, the rule, the reign of God in their lives. They, were, they chose to separate themselves from God, from the source of all life. They, they, they chose to, to um, die spiritually, basically. When they separated themselves from God, they died spiritually. And, and in effect, what they chose to do in this moment was to, to renounce their citizenship in the kingdom of God. Um, in, in, in taking themselves out from under the rule and the reign of God, they became citizens of a different kingdom. Okay, and we'll talk about that later. But the story, oh, and then also, um, it was only after this point, when Adam and Eve fell, okay, when they separated themselves from God, when, when, they, when they rebelled against him, when they died spiritually, after they renounced their citizenship in the kingdom of God, it was after this point that they began to have children. And so the problem with that is that they passed their own spiritual condition onto their children. So all of their children after them were born separated from God, spiritually dead, and citizens of a different kingdom. Okay, from this point on, um, Genesis chapter 3, after that, the Bible begins to basically tell the story of God's work in redeeming the human race and all of creation, for that matter. And so um, we, we see in John chapter 1 how the light comes into the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. It says the word becomes flesh and dwells among us and we, 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 we perceive his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, and so the imagery in this verse is of wor a world that is immersed in darkness once again. It's almost like the imagery of Genesis chapter 1, where in the beginning God creates the heavens and the earth, and the earth are without form and void, and darkness hovers over the face of the deep. It, it, and then God says, let there be light. It's the same imagery. Okay, the world is just shrouded in the darkness of sin and death, and under the dominion uh, of sin and death and Satan. Okay, and so into this darkness, God sends his own son. His son is light and light pierces that darkness. Okay. We know that, that God sent his son into the world because he so loved the world so that all who believed in his son would not perish, but have everlasting life. And, and what 
Jesus did, okay, when he came to this earth is he lived this perfect life that Adam should have, okay? He lived a life of perfect righteousness. But, but unlike Adam, okay, Jesus chose obedience to his father over what was expedient or best for him, okay? What would have been best for Jesus would have been to not be flogged, to, to not be blindfolded and beaten, to not have his beard ripped out, to not have to carry his cross to Golgotha and eventually be um, crucified through his hands and his feet and, and to eventually die and be put in the grave, okay? And so he chose to be obedient to his father and, and go all the way to the grave um, on behalf of his bride, the church, rather than to choose what would have been better for him. Okay, and so in doing that, he purchased our redemption by his own blood. Okay, and he, and he transfers to us um, his own merit, his own righteousness, takes upon himself our own sin, pays for our sin in his blood, and he redeems us back to his Father. So all who come to the Father through him are now saved and redeemed and restored to relationship with God. So there's no longer a separation. We now have relationship with the Father in Christ. We have spiritual life and regeneration that takes place in us um, because of Christ. And, and, and we have a new citizenship, which Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, he delivers us from that dominion, the rule, the reign, the authority, the kingdom of darkness. He gives us new citizenship in the kingdom of his beloved son. And so really we're restored um, as Adam was. And, and then what takes place for this, uh, from this moment forward is, is that in every minute, in every hour, in every day, in every week, in every month, in every year, for the rest of our lives, um, we are now um, having the image of the Creator, the image of Christ being restored um, within us, okay? And so we're being formed in the image of Christ. And this is the process that's taking place in us. And this is what Paul um, was talking about in, in chapter 3. He's been talking about it all through this chapter, okay? It says you've been buried with him in baptism. You've been raised with him, okay, um, in his resurrection. And he's saying in verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. He says, set your mind on the things that are above and not on the things that are on this earth, okay? And so, He's saying, look, don't seek the mores of this culture. Don't seek the wisdom of this age. Don't think, seek the things of this world. Don't spend your life okay, seeking to think like the way the world thinks, to, to, to emulate the people that are around you. Don't seek out their wisdom and their way of doing things and their perspective on what's good and evil and right and wrong. And don't seek the things of this earth like money and, 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 and possessions, just stuff and build yourself a big pile of stuff. Because guess what? Where you're going, you can't take it with you. So he's saying, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seek eternity. Seek his wisdom. Seek his understanding. Seek his knowledge. Seek his original design for you okay and so he says put off then put away um what is earthly in you the sexual immorality the covetousness the the impure thoughts the evil desires the unforgiveness the anger the wrath the malice the slander um the the obscene talk put all these things away from you that belongs to the old identity that along belongs to the old you and he says put on rather put on um, the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. This is our whole purpose in life. We are the image bearers. So just as God's original intention was for, for Adam and Eve to fill the earth with image bearers, okay? Filling the earth with the image of God, the glory of God, and all creation worshiping him. But instead, they filled the earth with death and sin, okay, and rebellion. Now, Christ has come. He's redeemed us. And once again, he's made us image bearers. The image of Christ is being formed in us and through us, he is being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth with the image and the glory of God. Amen? And so it's, it's in this context that I want to read verses 18 and 19 as we begin to talk about how this plays out in the Christian family. In verse 18, Paul says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wife and do not be harsh with them. Or another translation says, do not be bitter toward them. Okay, and so what Paul is doing is he's saying, okay, this is how 
um, the image of God is to be formed in you as a husband and as a wife. Okay, so each of you, okay, as just believers, as those who are in Christ, should be dying to the old self should be submitting yourself to him, should be putting away those things that are that are earthly in you, should be dying to the anger and the wrath and the, and the slander and the anger and, and, and the sinfulness, should be um, putting on the attributes of Christ. So it's like as the spirit of Christ and the word of Christ are forming Christ in you, you're also putting on externally these attributes of Christ, of the kindness and the goodness and the, and the humility and the meekness, these, these attributes of Christ, and you're becoming more like him. And now in the context of marriage, we, we see how is the image, how is the design of God being manifested in us together as a couple. Um, Paul goes into this a little bit more deeply in Ephesians chapter 5, and, and it starts in verse 22. I'm not going to read this whole passage because it's kind of long, but um, but, he, but he goes into a little bit more what the design, the purpose of that God had, the original intention God had for the marriage, and how that was to reflect him. Okay, and so he says in verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Then he says the husbands in verse 25, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, okay? And so how did Christ love the church? Well, well he died for her. He came to this earth, he left glory, and the worship he was due was due to his name in heaven. He left, took on human flesh, lived a, a perfect sinless life, and then took the punishment of us upon himself on the cross. He shed his blood for us, okay? And so Christ loved his church, by dying and giving everything for her, okay? Husbands, love your wife as Christ loves the church. And so this picture that Paul gives us of the godly Christian husband loving his wife, the way he is to love his wife is to die to himself, okay? He is to, to let the image of Christ, his whole focus is on dying to himself, dying to the old him, letting Christ be formed within him, putting on compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, love, forgiveness, joy, putting on these things and, and becoming Christ, letting Christ be formed in him, and then loving his wife sacrificially, dying to his wants, his needs, his desires, his agendas, his goals, and loving his wife sacrificially, helping her to become the woman that God has intended always for her to be, okay? And then the wife, the image of the wife, is a woman who is also dying to herself, putting away what is earthly in her, putting away anger and wrath and malice and slander and, and, and unforgiveness and, and all these things, and, and instead allowing Christ to be formed in her. Now she's allowing Christ to come through her, putting on a compassionate heart and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and love and forgiveness and becoming the woman that God has called her to be. And as her husband loves her, in this self-sacrificial giving way where he lays down everything. He's, he's following Christ with all of his heart. He's loving her in this sacrificial way. The wife now feels safe in his love and responds with this, this respect and this, this ability to just support the husband in being the man that God has called him to be. Like he's such a godly man. He's going hard after God. He's, he loves his family. Like Christ loves the church. He gives himself for us. He, he is becoming the man God called him to be. And it helps the wife in her side to be able to, to just support this leadership within him. Rather than, than feeling like she needs to try to control things because she can't trust him. No, she can trust him. And so she's able to, to support him. Um, she doesn't need feel a need to undermine his leadership, but, but to support him in the role that God's given him as the leader of their family. And the funny thing is, as she begins to support him in this way and respect him in this way, the husband just feels even more love for her and pulls her close. It's like the Proverbs 31 woman where it says of her that the heart of her husband safely trusts her. It, it, he, he feels like he can just trust her with his whole self. He's able to just give her, this, this is what's on my heart. These are my hopes. These are my dreams. These are my desires for our family as we follow Christ and, and knows that he can trust her with those things. She's not going to cut him down and, and, and try to undermine those things and, and throw anything in his face. She's going to just support him and love him in that. And then as, as he pulls her close, as he feels that respect and he draws her close and just pours more of his love on her, it's funny, it becomes this positive cycle. The husband loving the wife, the wife respects the husband. And, and this is how this image, a, a picture is formed of Christ and his church. So God's original intention for the marriage was that the husband and wife relationship 
would emulate and mirror the relationship of Christ to his church. And this is the image that's to be formed in us. He says it in verse 32 of Ephesians chapter 5. He says, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So just as each of us is to be an image bearer of Christ, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it with the kingdom of God, right? Mm -hmm. To shine forth his glory. So the husband and the wife in their relationship are to be the image of Christ and his church. It's almost like they're preaching the gospel with their marriage. This is the picture that Paul's giving us in Colossians chapter 3 verses 18 and 19.